Well, hello and welcome to our next episode, episode 10 of our journey through 1 Corinthians. Today we're looking at 1 Corinthians 5, verse 1 to 13, and it comes at a little bit of a health risk. It's one of the trickier passages we have in the whole of Scripture. Uh, and so as we do it, we, we want to just make sure that we are really faithful to the word, but also that we expound it in a way that is really helpful. So this episode might be a little bit longer than the others, but I think it's really important that we, we capture the right things in this. Secondly, is that when we get to difficult pieces of scripture, we don't just bypass them, but we actually wrestle with them in a way that's helpful, that teaches us, that helps us to put it into context of the whole of the scriptures. Um, so with that in mind, let me read to you 1 Corinthians 5, verse 1 to 13. It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife, and you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out your fellow, your, out of your fellowship the man who has been doing this? For my part, even though I am not physically present, I am with you in spirit. As one who is present with you in this way, I have already passed judgment in the name of our Lord Jesus on the one who has been doing this. So when you are assembled, and I am with you in spirit, and the, Lord, and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast, so that you may be a new, unleavened batch, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old bread leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral, or the greedy and swindlers, or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I am writing to you that you may, must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral, greedy, an idolater, a slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler. Do not even eat with such people. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked person from among you. Now, as you can see, this passage is quite tricky. We don't really like to talk about sort of expelling people from the fellowship or expelling people from churches. But here they've hit on a really key thing that that all churches will probably at some point deal with. When you get a group of people together, uh, and some of them are fairly new to faith, and some of them have been around for a while, you do get people that come out with all sorts of strange things. People who are living in their, in their BC days, as we used to refer to it um, when I was in school. In their before Christ days. There are, there are yearnings within all of us, to sort of carry on in the way we used to live. But we know that we are different as we come into Christ. The Spirit of the Lord has been transforming us to be more like Jesus daily. And that means that some of the desires and passions that we had before coming to know Jesus uh, sort of don't anymore. We don't want them. But sometimes they do sort of come up and we have to deal with them. And one thing we've got to remember is we're all human beings, that we're open to making mistakes, but at the same time we're, we're open to listening to the Spirit of God and to be being corrected as we wrestle with Scripture, as we open our lives up to the Spirit's light, and as we, as we meet together. It means that we keep each other accountable with our actions, and we call people out where we need to. But remember, here Paul is specifically talking about people inside the Corinthian church. But of course, 
you know, sometimes in all of our churches, we may have new believers that we just need to pastor through it, that we need to disciple, that we need to show them the way of Jesus. We need to begin to help them to be apprentices of Christ. Of course, sex is often one of the things that has come up over the last eight to ten years of ministry within the church. Sex has been a problem that has come up over and over and over again. We in the UK live in a highly sexualized environment. You can't you can't turn the TV on, even the news for very long without sex being something that is is there in your face all the time. And yes, just so everyone's clear, I did mention sex. Sex is a really important thing. It's something that God created. It's something that's great and builds community. Um, I love sex. It's really important. It, it helps bring marriages together um, and it's good fun. We have to remember though, God created it. It brings two people together under a covenantal relationship of marriage. A relationship between a man and a woman. And this is the, the sort of relationship that Paul is addressing here in 1 Corinthians 5. The, the marriage service is really clear and we've been given that as a, a sort of a document that's been carried on. That as a couple grow together in the delight and tenderness of sexual un, union, they will give each other to each other. They will give themselves to the other in body, soul and mind. But of course, sex is a huge opportunity to be uh, great and to build culture and to bring families together. But it's also a huge opportunity to be divisive and damaging to those very communities that it's there to create. So what is the answer then? As a Christian, we have very different ethics when it comes to sexuality. If we have a look at verse 9 to 12, it says this. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In this case, you'd have to leave the world. But I'm writing to you who claim to be brothers or sisters, but is sexually immoral or greedy or an idolater or drunkard or swindler. Do not even eat with such people. Paul is addressing those inside the church. And we, we heard very clearly that Paul has written to them probably about this before, saying to get rid of that person. To those outside the world, just for a moment as we, as we look at that, that's talking about people who, who don't know very much about Jesus. Those who we might bump into in our workplaces or in pubs or, or wherever we go. What Paul's not saying is stay away from them. Otherwise, we would have to be outside of this world. He's saying reach those people, be Jesus to those people. Sometimes the church is so, so bothered about isolating itself against the things of the world that we're no good to anyone. So mix with people. Mix with your family, mix with your friends who aren't princesses of Jesus. Go to the places where people go. It's all right. But what it's not saying is completely adopt the culture that we're in. It doesn't mean we condone the behaviour, but it doesn't mean we judge people on that. We're there to represent Jesus wherever we go. So why don't we do that? But for those who are Jesus' apprentices... Our words and actions make a big difference. We can't just say one thing. We can't just say that we're followers of Christ and not show it in some sort of action. There has to be the claims and then the evidence of that. If we claim to be, be brothers and sisters in Christ, then we should not be sexually immoral. We should not be wanting to, in this case, have sex without stepmothers. Here is very important. We need to really delve into this. We need to say, okay, this is not okay. This is not okay for the Corinthian church, and this is not okay for us. So let's have a look at that. It says, don't even eat with them. 
have nothing to do with them, even to the point of excluding them from the Lord's table, showing that the, the church are, are saying this is not okay, but also by expelling them from the Lord's table, it means that there's a judgment on them. And that judgment is very clear. Paul says, hand them over to Satan. Wow, that's strong. And it's that warning that he was talking to them about in, in 1 Corinthians 4.14. He was warning them about the sexually immoral. Paul's first letter probably addressed this issue and passed judgment already. And it has really strong links with Matthew 18. If one person sins against you, go and tell that person. If not, take another. And if not, then treat that person like a tax collector and pagan. If, if there are sexually immoral people amongst us, even at Telford Minster, we will be dealing with it in line with Scripture. We're not above Scripture. We sit underneath it. And so we'll be looking at the Scriptures hard and saying, what do we do with people but even for the pagan culture of Corinth what this person has done has been quite uh, divisive even the Corinthian culture are appalled by this even in a in a in a culture where there are temple prostitutes people are very at ease sleeping with one another even that they they don't see this case of incest as something that that should be condoned. So how much more so should, should the church not condone that behaviour? For the church, it's expulsion. In culture, it's probably that this person might be a bit of a social pariah. But for church, it's expulsion. Probably for a time, but might even go beyond that. And the reason why that is, is that this person claims to be a brother or sister in Christ, who claims to be a Jesus apprentice. If that person didn't, I don't think Paul would be writing this in the in the strong terms that he is. But because this person says they are a Christian, and it's not being shown, he he shows it in a way of the yeast of sin that goes through the dough. And this is something that is is in Jewish thought quite a bit that the the yeast or, or the or the leaven is put into bread and it spreads through like like sin spreads through the entire community. Paul doesn't want this sexual immorality to become part of the culture of the Corinthian church, which is why he wants to expel this person. He says to hand this person over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Very strong words like we've heard already. It probably involves physical suffering. If the church hands someone over to Satan, that person is not under the protection of Christ. And so is open to all sorts of things that Satan does. Secondly, it's probably to the point of death. So it's pretty serious. Paul is saying, I wish this person was probably dead. And it's really uncomfortable. This is someone who's a church leader who's planting a church and has planted a church. And as someone who is a church leader, I would find that very difficult. But here, it's almost the most caring thing to do for that person. Paul is saying that maybe their, their, their sexual promiscuity can't be saved, but maybe their flesh will be. Maybe their spirit will be as Jesus comes and rescues them because they are, of course, a believer. So what do we then make of it? Well, firstly, our words have power. The things we say really have power. If we expel someone, that, that's quite serious. And we would, if we did in, in Telford Minster, would do that alongside the bishops and the Church of England processes. But what we need to do with this passage is really wrestle with it again and again and again. Of course, sexual immorality isn't the only thing that Paul highlights in this passage. But of course, it's the thing that he's really highlighting. So let's think about it. God will judge those on the outside of the church. But on the inside of the church, we have got authority 
to have a look at the people around us and to say, right, are we living the way of Jesus? And if someone in our number isn't living the way of Jesus, let's talk about it. Because remember, collectively, we're on a journey. We're on a journey towards being apprentices of Jesus. We don't stop that. Whether we're 90 or whether we're 10, we're still on the journey to being more like Jesus. This, of course, is quite a, a difficult passage to go through. So do take time. Do join us this evening uh, for a chat about it. Uh, to get the link for the Zoom call, do email us at info at Telford minster.org.uk and we'd love to share that and to join in with this conversation.